Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about English centers, what they should be and what they shouldn't be. Now before we get started, please make sure to like and comment on this video as well as subscribe to my channel because I do need to go ahead and get those advertising dollars. So you subscribe to my channel, it helps me out and it helps you out too because you'll be notified whenever I make new content that you might want to go ahead and look at or listen to. Because I know you may not be looking at my you know, smiling mug all the time. You may just be listening to my voice. And that's perfectly fine too. Now, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, an English center. English centers in Vietnam, their main job is to go ahead and provide English to students here in various cities. Now, the problem is the fact that you have good English centers, you have bad English centers. So, what's the difference? I'll go ahead and tell you. A good English center is very, very, very rare. They're very few and far between. These English centers actually care about you. They care about your future. They don't play games with you. They don't steal from you. Now, the English centers that I don't like are the ones that do the exact opposite. They like to play mind games. They like to steal from you. They like to make you work long hours for very low pay and then claim they can't pay you while the boss is driving a nice brand new car you know, and stuff like that, yeah. So, we all know what an English center shouldn't be, all right? We've all worked in places like that. We've worked in places where the hours were too long, the pay was terrible, the coworkers were bad for one reason or another, the boss was terrible for one reason or another, or you were made to go from point A, which is like, I don't know, your house or wherever you live, all the way to point B, which may be like 20, 30 kilometers away each day, you know, each way, each day. Just like I mentioned in the one video about how I had to go from my house in Quan Moi High District 12 all the way out to a school near Long An Province in Huon Hoc Mon. Yeah, that's not going to work, you know. So if your English center mistreats you, it's not a good one. So what makes a good English center? That's what I want to talk to you about. See, <coughs> excuse me. I was always asked, what would happen if I won the lottery? What if I won, say, the special, but I had, say, 20 or 30 of the same ticket, so I won that much more? So say I win, let's just say I win $20 billion, all right? That's 20 followed by, I think it's like nine zeros, all right? So $20 billion. Now, what would I do with that much money? First things first, I pay taxes because as an American citizen, especially winning the lottery with that much cash, you have to pay taxes on it. And if you don't, then they get you like they did Al Capone. Now, after I go ahead and pay taxes on it, I also pay taxes to both governments. So I pay taxes to the U.S. government, pay taxes to the Vietnamese government. After all the taxes are settled, I go ahead and maybe get about half. So, you know, after taxes, I may get about half left. So say about 10 billion dollars is what I get left. Now, what I would do with that money is quite simple. I'd actually go ahead and buy a building first. Instead of having, instead of renting one out, I would actually buy a building. Now, this building in the beginning, it wouldn't have to be that big because of the fact that it wouldn't be an English center starting out. It would be a temporary employment agency for schools in the cities, in the provinces where that specific place is located at. Now, people like temp agencies, oh no, no, it's not like that at all. See, my center would be a lot different because in the beginning it would start out as a temp agency, but my center would have very, very, very super strict standards as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Now, obviously, my center is going to obviously follow the laws very, very closely. This way, we don't have to have any visits from people we don't need to talk to. So, first things first, how do you get employed as an English teacher in Vietnam? Well, the laws are murky in some areas, but they're actually quite clear in others. In order to be qualified as a native English speaker, you must, qual you must go ahead and come from a country where English is the main spoken language but also because of the fact that they want someone who sounds like me, not someone who can barely speak English at all. I'll get to that later. See, 
the Cambridge English Dictionary defines a native speaker of any particular language as a person who has spoken that particular language since birth rather than having learned it as a child or an adult. Now, by that definition, if a person was not born and raised speaking English, they are not a native English speaker. If they speak another language since birth and they learn English in second, third, fourth grade, so on, they are not native English speakers. Now, why do many non-native speakers claim to be native speakers? That's quite simple because here in Vietnam, brace yourselves, racism. Yeah, very, racism is very, very common here in Vietnam. It's one of those things that a lot of people don't like to talk about, but it's something that's very, very prevalent among the expat groups. See, it's quite common knowledge that if you have white skin, like I do, you will get paid a lot more versus someone with dark skin. It doesn't matter if, say, another person and myself are both from the United States. It doesn't matter because I have white skin. I will be paid more, and I think that's terrible. I do. I think it's terrible. I'll give you an example. One of my friends, he has over 19 years of experience teaching English. He's taught in places like China. He's taught in Singapore. You know, he knows Russian, Mongolian, Mandarin, Chinese, English. He knows languages. You know, he can teach English. He's perfect with kids. But yet an English center here in Ho Chi Minh City refused to hire him because he's African-American. And when I asked them why... All my messages got marked as spam. And if you know who you are, you know who I'm talking about. Because I was actually there, and I went ahead and advocated for my friend while he was going through the interview process, and you guys never called him back. See, with this guy in particular, I actually went with him to his interview because of the fact that I knew about this center. And I knew that I wanted to support my friend. So I went with him to his interview and the two ladies that were there decided to keep speaking in Vietnamese even though I asked them three times not to because why are you speaking Vietnamese in front of people who may not be able to understand it why because they're trying to cover something up if they are trying to say something they don't want you to know then they want to speak it in a language that you're not gonna be able to comprehend so that's a tip for you if you ever get to an interview and they speak in Vietnamese, tell them flat out, please speak in English. I don't understand what you're saying. Anytime they speak in Vietnamese, just say, please speak in English. I don't understand what you're saying. And if they keep looking at you weird, just go ahead and be like, well, I think you're trying to hide something because you're speaking in Vietnamese. You know, I don't understand Vietnamese. Why are you speaking Vietnamese? That'll get a lot of them to be quiet. But at the same time, it'll also hurt your job opportunities. So. Use that at your own risk. Anyways, moving on. So the difference between native and non-native speaker. All right. It's like I covered in my last video. If a native speaker and a non-native speaker, they both have the exact same experience. They have the exact same years in teaching English and they both sound the exact same. Why is the native speaker paid more than a non-native speaker? Even though both have the exact same qualifications It's because of race. Because I've heard of people from the Philippines, people from India coming here to teach English in Vietnam, and they're being paid eleven, twelve hundred dollars, thirteen max. Well, native speakers are getting two thousand, twenty two hundred plus for the exact same work. Why? It's like I went and mentioned in the previous clip that the labor code specifically says that labor discrimination is against the law. That includes discrimination based on race, nationality, national origin, creed, ethnicity, uh, like gender identity, I think now, also uh, religion, HIV infection status, marital status, family obligations. There's all kinds of stuff that the labor protect that the labor code protects against, you know, and protects foreign, protects people from, you know, getting messed up by their employers. Now, that's what I wanted to say. Anywho, moving on. So, essentially, we've already talked about English centers and why they go ahead and discriminate. Now, with my center, it'd be completely different because my center would, it, my center would enforce the hiring laws to the strictest standards. We would make sure that all documents are authentic. We're not going to accept anything bogus. 
we're not going to accept EF set because I call that the easy forge. I see pictures on Facebook all the time that talk about that. How you can purchase a C2 certificate with an additional TESOL certificate for, say, $100 or $20 or something like that. And I go, uh-huh, click. And then I show it online go, do not buy from these people. You actually have to go get your TESOL certificate or your... Okay, for non-native speakers, it is a law here in Vietnam that non-native speakers must have IELTS, TOEIC, or TEFL at C1 Advance or above according to the CEFR scale. This certificate must be less than two years old, must be current, obviously, and must not be a forgery. The reason why this is a requirement is because of the fact that according to, I think it is Decree 152-2020 NDCP, I think that is where the law is at that specifically describes this. I'd have to look at it in detail, but the law itself was passed, I think it was in 2018, 2019, but it was put into effect in 2020. Now, also with that particular decree, it also mentions work permit rules and things like that, but that's laws and stuff like that. We're, we'll get into laws in a different chapter entirely. Now, moving on. So we make sure the paperwork is authentic. That's step number one. No fake paperwork, no easy forge, you know, none of that. Only authentic paperwork. Two, online interview. Online interview, you actually get to know the person first a little bit before you invite them down to the office. This is the way you can go and get a feel for them. Are they authentic? Are they who they say they are? You never know. So if you want to do the online interview first, that would be recommended. If not, you can just do an in-person interview. Just skip all that and just go straight to the in-person interview. And actually, once I actually get this project in motion, that's exactly what I do. Just skip and go straight to the in-person interview. So once you do the online interview and you like the person, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and have the person come in for an in-person interview. This way I can get to know them more. Now, if I like everything I see as far as their appearance, their hairstyle, how their even their nails are kept, you know, your whole grooming standards, everything. Because when I become a boss, when I become the owner of my own English center, I will evaluate my staff on everything. Reason why is because of the fact that my dream essentially is to go ahead and have my English center to be the best one out there, to beat VUS, to beat all the big name, you know, ILA, OLA, you know, all the big name centers. I want my center to replace all of them. And that's why I would hold my staff to the strictest standards. And that if any of my staff don't like my standards, they can they can go ahead and walk out the door. Because of the fact that the way I see it, I expect the pet, I, excuse me, there's a blooper for you. I expect the best, therefore I pay the best. See, with me, with my English center specifically, I am going to pay decently with decent benefits especially benefits that are prescribed by law. Like I went and mentioned, like paid time off, paid holidays off, uh, annual leave, you know, things like that, and uh, compensation under the law, you know, stuff like that. Also, with me specifically, I'm going to treat people with dignity, honor, and respect, with empathy and kindness too. Because of the fact that you don't know who they are, you don't know where they came from, you don't know what their situation is. So I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt. So I go ahead and hire this person and I go ahead and tell them, okay, well, everything checks out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and give you a cover class to see how well you do. I want to be in the classroom and I'm going to evaluate how well you do. If I like what you do, then you get hired. If not, well, then that's a cover class. You still get paid for it after class. Yeah, that's another thing my center is going to do is pay demos. You know why a lot of English centers like giving unpaid demo lessons? Because they're trying to cash in on free labor. They want to haul in prospective English teachers, make them teach a class, and then, oh, nope, we're not going to give you a job. And then they move on to someone else. That's how some centers keep going through staff like this because they want to keep doing free English lessons. And, yeah, so, anywho, moving on. So, essentially, treating my staff with respect and kindness and paying them decently and giving them benefits is one of the reasons why one of my center is actually going to be the most popular. Now, at first, as I mentioned, it's going to start out as just a temp agency, which is fine. 
because what the goal of my temp agency would be would be to pair English teachers with schools. That includes kindergarten, that includes primary, secondary, that includes university, that includes private schools, that includes international schools, that includes anywhere an English teacher might need to be, including business accounts. Yeah, some corporate accounts actually hire English teachers to teach their staff English, which is perfectly fine. Now, the thing is, though, even though it's a temp agency and stuff like that, we still have to get work permits for all, all of our foreign speaking staff, you know, all of our foreign staff. Which means that if anybody wants to get a job with me, they'd really better commit themselves. Because the fact that the labor code says you can have up to five work permits within a two year period, and that's perfectly fine. But one of the things you need to remember, you can't have more than five. And not only that, as far as your TRC card goes, I keep getting conflicted information about that. In one camp, I hear that your TRC card is tied to your work permit. And if your employer cancels your work permit, they also cancel your TRC card, which means you have to leave the country or else you're going to be cited as an illegal. You know, you don't want that. So, but the other camp goes ahead and says that your TRC card, once procured for you, is independent of any specific job and you can use that as long as you stay inside the country. But the TRC card, for business is only good for one year and it has to be renewed every year. That's the reason why you need to stay with your job so they can go ahead and renew your TRC card because trying to find a business to do another business to do that, it's not easy. Now, here's the thing with businesses that do your work permits and TRC cards, just like I said in the last video, they are required to pay for that, not you. If they try and say, oh, well, we support you 50%, we support you 25%, we support you in two years, no. They are required by law to do that automatically. They pay 100% for your work permit, your TRC card, your police check, your health check, anything that's required for you to go ahead and become an English teacher here in Vietnam. That includes certification and translation of your documents too. So you better save your receipts. So, and that's exactly what my center would do too. We pay for everything. Work permit, TRC card, the police check, health check. We pay for everything. As long as people save their receipts, we will reimburse them just like that. Now, here's the thing. Also, beyond the paperwork, you know, proper checks, everything like that, that demo that I mentioned, that cover class demo, that would be my way of evaluating the teacher, whether or not they're actually a good fit for my center or not. Now, one of the things I go ahead and evaluate as far as appearance goes is simple. For male teachers, and for all you male teachers out there that are watching this video, you may agree with me, you may disagree with me. But remember, for me, this will be my center, my rules. And for those of you that scoff and laugh at me, that's cool. I honestly don't care. But like I said earlier, it's my center, my rules. And when I say don't do this, don't do that, or whatever, either you listen or you leave. It's that simple. So moving on. So for male teachers, I'm going to expect the following, that you're reasonably dressed. That means business pants, business shirt, which, which can be either long sleeve or short sleeve, provided that you don't have any tattoos. And yeah, I have tattoos myself. I actually have four of them. But a lot of people here in Vietnam do not like seeing tattoos because they associate tattoos with bad character. So if you have tattoos, I don't care, but it better not be visible. So if you have like a full arm length tattoo, you know, you're going to have to wear long sleeve shirts. And if your hands are covered in tattoos, you have to wear gloves. You want to work for me, you got to cover up. It's that simple. It's also called professionalism too. Now, the way I see it in my personal center, I'll talk about that later as far as relaxing requirements go in my personal center. So for the male teachers, as I mentioned, you can either wear long or short sleeve shirts, business pants, but no visible tattoos. Now, one of the things I'm going to specifically say right here is no man buns. No man buns. If you have a man bun, no. I'm going to give you 50,000 dong to go to a hair place and get your hair cut so you can have a man's haircut or else you don't work for me. It's that simple. Now, people are like, oh, well, that's the new trend, blah, blah, blah. That's a new trend in the West. Not in Vietnam. 
Vietnamese men do not do their hair that way. Therefore, you do not do your hair that way. It's that simple. You never see Vietnamese male teachers with man buns. Not one. You see Vietnamese teachers that are male with respectable haircuts. Now, sometimes you might see a line, you know, going on the side of their head. And that's stylish. I've seen that, and that's perfectly fine. Now, as long, the way I see it, as long as it's not too over the top, it's perfectly fine. But, like I said, for male teachers that work for me and male staff that work for me, no man buns. You can have a short hairstyle that is respectable. Now, also, some people will say that, you know, you should have a beard, that you should be clean shaven all the time. And while I agree with that, me personally, I can't shave because my face, it hurts every single time I shave. Because my stubble, it grows in unusual directions and it makes it hard for me to shave. So I'm going to make it optional to shave. So if you want to shave, great. If not, just make sure it's trimmed close and respectable. No hobo beard. If you have a hobo beard, you're not going to go ahead and get a job with me. Because of the fact it's also about professionalism. Now for men, also, no piercings. No piercing jewelry, none of that. If you have earrings, like if you have your ears pierced like I do, that's great. Just don't wear earrings while you're on the job. If you have eyebrow piercings, nose piercing, tongue piercing, I have a tongue piercing. But you don't have your jewelry in while you're working. Because if me or one of my staff catches you doing that, it's not going to be good. We'll discuss punishment and stuff later on. So for male teachers, like I mentioned, you got to have a decent appearance. You know, no piercing jewelry in. If you're married, you can wear a wedding band, obviously. If you want to wear a nice watch, you can do that too. If you want to wear a wristband, like some people go ahead and have a, a wristband that they go ahead and wear. If I had mine on me, I'd show you, but I don't. Anyways, so if you have some nice, tasteful jewelry you want to wear, that's fine. Now, as far as religious jewelry goes, here's a big thing. While you will see students wear either crosses for those who are Catholic or Christian, or you will see Buddhist amulets for those who are Buddhist, in my opinion, religion is one of the four forbidden subjects that can't be discussed at school. This means you can't talk about religion, you can't talk about drugs, you can't talk about politics, and you cannot talk about sex, a.k.a. human relations. Now, here's the thing. To me, I don't consider that to be a bad word, but it is what it is. Anyways, moving on. So, we can't talk about those four things. So, what happens is, is when you have a teacher that walks into a classroom with a religious necklace on that automatically puts the students off in my opinion so i would not allow the teachers to wear large religious jewelry if the jewelry is small i will allow it now what do i mean by large religious jewelry if it's this big like this big like four centimeters big no that's too big all right if you're talking about something that's maybe one, two centimeters like this, perfectly fine. But no honking huge, you know, items, you know, like that. None of that. Now, also, so, you know, we covered like religious jewelry and stuff like that. Now, see, the law and religion and folk belief specifically states that a person can believe or not believe as they see fit, as long as they do not harm the state or state interests. Now, that also applies with me. I don't care what you believe in. The only thing I care about is how hard you work. That's it. If you have special religious needs that you need to accommodate, such as for those who are Muslim, they need to pray five times a day. That's perfectly fine with me. We will go ahead and set aside time for you to specifically so that you can go ahead and attend your prayers. Because even though I may not share the same religion as you do, I am going to make sure that you go ahead and get the religious fulfillment that you need. And for those who are not religious, that's perfectly fine too. We will go ahead and make sure that your interests are also listened to at the same time. So, moving on. My center is going to hire everyone equally, regardless if you're male, female, you know, just at the minimum age to teach English, which I think is 21 or 23, something like that. Minimum age to teach English, all the way up to people in their 50s. 
As long as you can prove to me that you can work, I don't care how old or young you are. I don't care if you're male or female. All I care about is how hard you work. Also, you know, you also have to meet the requirements to be able to teach English here legally in Vietnam. But then after I go ahead and do all that, we're going to go ahead and talk about. So we talked about the male and how the male teacher is supposed to dress. Now, female teachers. This is a big one. For female teachers, it's a little different. Female teachers also should not wear earrings, even though they will see female Vietnamese teachers wear earrings. In my opinion, should not wear earrings because it would be more professional that way. Now, so we've covered don't wear earrings. Also, for females, you can have long hair or short hair just as long as it is appropriately styled. If you choose short hair, that's cool. I don't mind. Just as long as it's it's styled neatly. You know, if you want a man's if you're a woman and you want a man's haircut, that's fine. Just make sure it looks nice. Now, as far as men, yeah, men specifically must have short hair only because it's cultural norms here, which is what I'm trying to protect. So, we're going to move on from that. So, female teachers can have longer short hair as long as it's appropriate appropriately styled. No earrings for professional reasons. No large religious jewelry, also for professional reasons. Female staff can wear either pants or a dress, depending on their preference, and long or short sleeve shirt, again, depending on their preference and if they have tattoos. Yes, I have encountered a few female teachers that have tattoos. Personally, I don't care about that. You want to have tattoos? That's fine. I have tats myself. So, and the other thing, is for professional reasons, I will require closed toe shoes for both male and female employees. This means that you can wear, like, I don't know, running shoes, leather shoes, as long as your shoes, and not sandals or flip-flops, then you're fine. Now, that goes for both male and female employees. I don't want to see any open-toed shoes. Now, as far as payment goes, I would pay my teachers on time every single month, usually on the 10th of each month. Why the 10th? It's simple. Because of the fact it gives me time to receive money on the 1st, have it go through my accountant, have my accountant go and pay necessary bills and things like that before I go ahead. Because see, here's what an English Center has to pay for first. If I actually buy the building, I don't have to worry about rent. But if I don't buy the building, I have to worry about rent. So here's the thing first. First, you have to worry about rent if you didn't buy the building. But say in this scenario, I bought the building, so I don't have to worry about rent. So we don't have to worry about rent. So we have to pay utilities on the building. That includes electric, water, possibly gas, as well as internet access. So we have to pay utilities. Then after that, we have to go ahead and pay insurance on the building too. Because the business, you have to pay business insurance. Also, you have to pay taxes. Yeah, that's the other thing. When you pay your employees, when you... Receive money when you pay money to your employees, you have to pay taxes on it. So you go ahead and give your accountant enough time to go ahead and pay people, pay the accounts, then turn around and pay staff because you have to have the accounts open in order to pay your staff. Because if you don't have any internet access, you can't contact the banks. You see what I mean? So you have to pay your utilities first. But obviously, there's going to be enough money to go around that that's not going to be an issue. So the teachers would actually have their choice of either cash or direct deposit. If they want cash, that's fine. But they would have to be at the center at a certain time in order to get their cash payment. And it would have to be, you know, counted out right in front of them. You know, this way they go ahead and know that they got the right amount. Now, as far as taxes go, taxes for my employees are simple. I will make sure that all my employees pay taxes, even my teachers that receive cash payments for their salary. I will make sure that they pay their taxes and that they go ahead and get the proper forms to go ahead and reimburse you know, their taxes at the end of the year. And also, besides the taxes and everything else, what I'm also going to do is make sure that when I go around the buildings, I'm going to do my inspections. See, as the owner of this center, it would be my job to make sure that I only give my clients the best. I don't want to give my clients anything less than the best. So my job as the owner wouldn't be to sit behind a desk all day long. No. 
my job as owner would be to go around to all the schools where all my teachers are at and watch them myself. Now, yes, I can hire someone to do this for me, and I might actually do that, you know, but actually take the time to do this myself from time to time just because I feel like it. So I'd go to a school and I'd just watch. Of course, I would go ahead and have a good relationship with the school that I'm visiting so I can just tell the security guard, hey, I'm the owner of this English center. I'm here to look at my teachers while they teach. You can come watch me if you want. So the guard may, may not. Who cares? So I go up there and I watch the English teacher. Now, say this English teacher is doing a you know, great job, fantastic job, right? So what would I do? I go ahead and go, okay, well, you know, I watched you earlier and you did great. So here's a bonus. You know, here's $100,000 for doing a great job. You know, go ahead and actually praise your employees like you surprise, you praise your employees, and it's great. But also on the flip side of that coin, if you catch your teachers doing something you're not supposed to, you can catch them right there on the spot. So with me, what I would want to do is not have TAs. And then people are like, you're crazy. How are you supposed to be able to control a classroom if you don't have a TA? Well, I can tell you that for a fact. See, if a teacher is a true professional, a true professional should be able to control a classroom without a TA. But if they wanted us to give them TAs, more than likely we would talk to the school and see what the teachers could do. If they don't want to do anything, that's fine. Then we'll turn around and hire TAs. But these TAs that I'm talking about, if I have to hire them, which I really don't want to, they would have to have the same standards as a non-English speaking teacher, which means they must also have IELTS, TOEIC, or TEFL at C1 Advanced or above as well as a teacher certificate and everything else that they need to be able to teach English legally here in Vietnam. So I would hold them to very high standards. Any TA that I get that works for my center is not allowed to play on the phone, not allowed to check up on YouTube or Facebook, uh, Zalo, you know, Instagram, none of that. The TA is required to actually help the teacher in the classroom, control the students, answer questions, you know, stuff like that. And if there's a problem, they get the response staff immediately, like the discipline supervisor. And essentially, if something happens, then the TA has to go ahead and tell the office staff, which in turn will tell me. Now, if they are caught doing something they're not supposed to, here's the discipline process. Say, for instance, we have a teacher that is defiant and wants to show up to school with a man bun. So either me or one of my staff catches this teacher with a man bun. So first offense, I sent him a text message saying, hey, one of my staff says they saw you with a man bun. Is this true? And then they're like, well, I don't see what my haircut has to do with anything. It, it's the trendy in the West or something like that. And I go, well, this is your first offense. See, I'm going to give you a warning this time, but please cut off your man bun. It's not appropriate. You need to cut it off. Now, obviously, I'm going to get a complaint from the school that says this guy has a non-traditional haircut. So, okay, I'm going to deal with that. Second offense, this guy still doesn't want to go ahead and get a haircut. Okay, cool. So this time I actually go to the school and actually have a talk with him in person after his class is over. I go, you, come here. Why do you still have a man bun? I sent you a text message last week asking you to get a haircut. Why do you still have a man bun? Okay, look, I tried to explain this to you before, but I'm going to have to explain it to you again that the West is not Vietnam. What is socially acceptable in the West is not socially acceptable here in Vietnam. You need to remember that. Now, this is your second warning. This is 50,000 dong. I want you to take this and go get a haircut to something that's more respectable. Now. If you do not go ahead and do this, and either me or one of my staff catches you with a man bun again, we're going to have another talk at the office. Please, get a haircut. So that's second warning. Third warning. This one's a big one. So say this guy's caught again a third time with a man bun. This time, he's called into the English Center or Temp Agency, I guess, as it still is at this point. And they'd go ahead and say, well... You know, I, I don't think it's right. I still want to keep my hair cut, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
Well, here's the thing, dude. We've already given you three strikes. All right, we've we've given you three opportunities to try and change this, and you didn't want to change it. So here's what we're gonna do. The law states that we only have to warn you once. That's it. I warned you three times. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and escalate this, and I'm going to go ahead and deny you a pay rise or promotion for the next six months. So this means no pay raise, no promotion, no nothing for the next six months. You must have a hairstyle that is in, that is indicative of Vietnamese culture. If you re still refuse, we're going to have to go ahead and escalate things further. So say this guy still does not want to get rid of man bun. Okay, cool. So he gets hauled into the office again. And, well, not hauled into the office, you know what I mean. He, he was summoned to the office. So we gave him a warning where he was already docked essentially a promotion or pay rise, pay raise, whatever, for the next six months. So next comes demotion. Now, for an English teacher, you can't be demoted. You can't be because there's no step lower than being an English teacher. Now, the way I see it is in that case, it would go straight to dismissal at that point because if he doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to get a haircut, he wants to keep his precious man bun, he can go get a job somewhere else. And the law specifically covers the employer when the employee refuses to follow company policy. So, and yeah, I talk about man buns a lot because I really don't like man buns. I don't like seeing man buns on English teachers. Quite a few times I asked English teachers, why do you have a man bun? Get a haircut, hippie. Yeah, I said that. And they're like, you know, blah, 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 yada, 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 blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. So essentially, you know, so we got all that. So essentially, I'd make sure to go ahead and follow the laws precisely when it comes to disciplining employees as well as praising them for their work. Now, here's the thing. With employees that do well, they will go ahead and get a bonus. If they do exceptionally well, they get promoted. That's one of the things that's different from other English centers versus mine is that my center, once it becomes a center, that's the thing. Okay, so we'll talk about that. So say, for instance, I go ahead and, and hire so many teachers and get so many clients that I'm actually able to get an English center. Well, this English center would have to be specifically built. It could not you cannot use an existing building. It has to be specifically brand new construction. Here's why. The fire code. The fire code is one of the most basic things ever. But a lot of businesses, especially karaoke parlors, are not able to go ahead and get new business licenses or whatever it is they need because they cannot come up to code. So that's the reason why. You build it on land that's safe and you make sure it is up to fire code so that it instantly passes all inspections. It has fire extinguishers on every floor, in every stairwell, in every classroom. Sprinkler systems in every classroom. So if there's a fire, boom, it's out just like that. Also, fire escapes. There'll be fire escapes everywhere. So this way, people can go ahead and get out of the building as quickly as possible. So let's talk about that. So say, for instance, an English teacher is doing really well, and the English center is actually now just built. So what do I do? I go ahead and gather a group of English teachers, say about 10 teachers, the best of the best, the creme de la creme of my staff. And I gather them, and they're all diverse. Men, women, young, old, people of many different skin tones. And I go ahead and tell them that you 10 are my best teachers. Because of this, I'm going to give you a promotion and a raise if you choose to take it, that is, to the English Center. The English Center only works at night from, say, I don't know, say maybe five in, in case of some schools not getting out at five, say six o'clock to nine o'clock at night or six to ten o'clock at night, depending on how late the kids actually want to stay for classes and such. So essentially... The post at the English Center would pay a lot more, and it's actually a promotion because 
If you have public school, then you have English Center, you move up because the classes, <laughs> excuse me, there'd only be five students max per class. That enables the English teacher to actually really get to know their kids. No need for a TA because the kids are going to be well behaved. This English Center is going to be a 100% English only speaking environment. This means there's going to be no Vietnamese TA, no Vietnamese English teacher. It's going to be a 100% English speaking environment. The only exception are two staff that sit in the office to go ahead and answer questions from prospective clients and parents of students. That's the only exception. Other than that, it's all 100% English. And also, cameras everywhere, cameras in every classroom. This way, if there's a problem, the cameras catch it and it's addressed quickly. Also, if we go ahead and tell a parent that their kid was acting up and they want to tell us that, oh, my kid's a little angel, we can go ahead and show them footage that said, hey, you sure about that? You might want to look at this. Now, see, here in Vietnam, it is known that it is not the parents that raise their kids, it's the teachers that do. But what are the teachers supposed to do when the kids are so rude, disrespectful, disobedient? What are the teachers supposed to do? I've encountered kids like that before. Kids that are very rude, very disobedient, disrespectful. They don't want to do what they're told. They are willfully defiant because they know you can't do anything. I've encountered kids like that before. Kids like that will not be at my school because I'm not going to deal with headaches or problems. Now, some people are like, well, that kid could be, you know, special ed. You know, he might need special education. That's true. There are specific schools for that, though. If he's in a public school, he is mismatched. So, moving on. That's actually one of the things that my center will cover are special needs students. Because what I would want to do, I feel that that's a market that's been neglected for too long. That English centers should have at least one class for special needs kids. But that teacher has to be special education certified. They have to be certified to deal with kids that have autism or kids that are mentally deficient or physically deficient in some way. You know, they have to be professionally trained to deal with kids like that. And then I would go ahead and have classes there for special needs students if I could find a teacher. And there would have to be at least two TAs for special needs kids. But I would make sure that the class is monitored at all times, make sure that there's at least two TAs, cameras, everything like that, and that the kids are being taken care of the way they should and that they're having quality education. So moving on. So we talked about allowing uh, special education classes in the center itself. So moving on, I'd go ahead and promote the teachers to the English center. Now, if they still want to work public school and English center, that's great. You know, they want to work, that's great. But the trick, by law, they cannot work more than eight hours per day. So if they wanted to work the school and the English center, that would actually bring them up to full-time hours of 40 hours a week. But I will caution you on one thing. If you work a schedule like that, you will be so exhausted that you will not know what to do. I can tell you for a fact that working in public school for at least 26, 27 hours a week is enough to physically drain you to the point where you have no energy to do anything on the weekend except sleep. And if you want to pull a full 40-hour shift, that's on you. But I wouldn't recommend it. Now, if you wanted to do that and you were willing to sign a waiver that says you know the consequences and you still want to work anyways, then fine. I'd make sure that you work a full 40-hour a week shift at $600,000 an hour. Because the way I see it, working at the public school, you may get about $540,000, $480,000 to $540,000 an hour. Reason why is because $480,000 is $8,000 a minute and $540,000 is $9,000 per minute. Now... 600,000 dong is 10,000 dong per minute. And that applies if you work at the English Center. Now, the English Center, it may not look too good during the school year because it's only at night, but during summer vacation is when it switches to all day mode. When it switches to all day mode, that's when the fun really begins. Because of the fact you have classes in the morning, you get to eat lunch with me, and then there's classes in the evening. 
And then after that, you go home. That's it. You know, it's an all day thing. You get to teach different kids, different ages, according to what you signed up for. And it's a real step up from teaching in the public schools. Now, eventually, I'd want to grow my center. And I mean, really grow it out. Because once I go ahead and get this one English center, I wouldn't be happy with just one. Oh, no. I'd want several of these partnerships between my temporary agency and my English centers because of the fact it would be hiring from within. The temp agency has to source the English centers. And I want my temp agency to source my English center. That's what I want. Now, it would happen not just in Ho Chi Minh City, but also in, I would also put a temp agency and center in Hanoi, as well as Hue, and maybe also Dalat once they start growing some more. But once I get beyond that, then everything gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because of the fact that once the center grows and it expands and people see how I actually treat my staff, as I mentioned earlier, with kindness, empathy, dignity, honor, and respect. I pay them on time. I treat them well. I give them great benefits. My center would be the place to work for. Everybody be happy to come work for me every single day. And all I ask is that you do your best. That's it. You do your best. You don't mess up. You don't break any rules. Yeah. You know. Now, another thing is that I don't like employees that cause drama. I don't. If you like to cause drama, you like to cause problems, stay away from my center. We don't we don't need that. Because I want my center to be more like a family of sorts. Like where people are always happy to see each other. You know, where friendships are made that are long lasting. You know, everybody's happy, wants to work together. That's what I want, that camaraderie. That's what I want. And people who cause drama aren't going to be a part of that. So if you cause drama, just go somewhere else. And with my center, I don't consider native or non-native speaker unless it's applied to the law. Like say if you come from some country where English is not the first language and I can hear an accent in your voice and you tell me you're a native speaker and I tell you you're not and you want to argue with me over having to have the English language proficiency certificates and I just tell you to get out because even though I will pay you the same as a native speaker, you still need to have paperwork that proves that you are legally able to teach English here in Vietnam. And if you are a non-native speaker, as defined by the Cambridge English Dictionary, like I said earlier, and you want to go ahead and try and tell me you're a native speaker, even though you're not, to try to avoid having extra paperwork, then you can get out. Plain and simple, because I'm not going to deal with people that want to argue about having paperwork that they know they need to have, but they just don't want to have it because they think they're slick. Other English centers are more than happy to take backpackers and tourist teachers, you know, fake English teachers. They're more than happy to do so. But those illegitimate English centers are what I want to try to destroy. And I will destroy them by not only teaching people about their rights through the labor code, but also go ahead and show people how a proper English center is supposed to run. So that even if somewhere down the road, an English teacher decides that they don't want to work for me anymore, that's fine. As long as they leave legally and they are taught the labor code. In my, in my English center, all my English teachers are going to learn the labor code. Because this way, like I said, even if they decide they don't want to work with me anymore, at least they're going to be armed with the tools that they need to protect themselves from unscrupulous employers. Mm-hmm. Now, I go ahead and teach them the labor code, teach them their rights and everything like that. And as long as they leave peacefully, everything's fine. Now, if people want to cause problems and try and not leave peacefully, try and leave legally, then yeah, you know, we're going to have a legal team to go ahead and counteract stuff like that. But generally, as long as people do what they're told, they don't break any rules, and they don't try and cause problems or anything like that, there's no issues. Now, my center, my temp agency, you know, stuff like that, 
it's not just for people looking for one class or two class, you know, stuff like that. It's for long-term employment because that's what the law says. You can't have people working for you without a work permit. You have to have a work permit. Now, people are like, well, your English center sounds great, but how much would it cost? Well, like I mentioned earlier, if I had 10 billion dong left over after paying, you know, lottery taxes and everything else, I'd buy a building for about 5 billion dong. This building would at least have two rooms, a kitchen, and a toilet. I think I can actually get that much cheaper, maybe about 500 million. Because I wouldn't need a real big office space. Just something big enough for a back office for myself, an office for staff, and a place for English teachers to hang out at while they're waiting for assignments to come in. Now, the English, the temp agency itself is going to have a kitchen for staff to make food with, a refrigerator, a toilet, stuff like that. Also, in case English teachers come by and they want to free drink or they want to use the Wi-Fi or the toilet, they can. That's not a problem. Um, now, the English Center itself, it's going to go ahead and have more, like more, uh, well, it's going to have more technology like projectors and stuff like that and uh, speakers and everything else, things that kids need. But again, the classes aren't going to be more than five kids. So that's why it's going to be so expensive. Now, again, with my center, I don't care if you're native, non-native, whatever. Just as so long as you actually have quality and you can do the work, that's what I care about. That's it. So, we've already talked about, you know, evil centers, why I don't like them, and how I'm going to go ahead and destroy them. Well, that's that. So, I already noticed that it's already like at 51 minutes. So, I'm going to go ahead and say this. One of the things I noticed when I was teaching English was the fact that we were treated like clowns. Like I said in, like I said in the previous clip, we were treated like clowns. We were expected to dance, sing, and do all this stuff. But at the end of the day, we were so wore out and so sad because of various issues that it just it was just emotionally draining. You see kids that can't speak English, and yet you're forced to pass them because that's what your English center told you to do. Don't give them below a 5. Don't give them below a C. You know, you have to give them a passing grade so they can go on to the next grade, even though their English is so terrible that they shouldn't be passed on. See, in my English center, I'm not going to auto-pass kids. If your kid does not pass, your kid does not pass. My school, my temp agency, my whole goal is to end auto pass and only pass kids that actually truly deserve it. Because as I, as I mentioned the other day, the strength of a nation is rooted in the integrity of the home. What good does it serve the nation to pass kids on to the next grade when they don't deserve it? Can anyone go ahead and answer that? What good does it to pass a kid on to the next grade? When the requirement is you must be able to speak English and be able to do all of this in English when the kid can't do that. Why was I paired with TAs that could not speak English? These are college age students that cannot speak English. Why is that? It's because of corrupted centers like what I mentioned earlier. Corrupted centers, they don't care. They will guarantee an automatic IELTS 6.5 or automatic IELTS 7.5. You can't guarantee IELTS because everybody's brain is different. Everybody thinks differently. One kid might want IELTS 7.5. One kid might want IELTS 9.0. You know, you never know what their brain is until you go ahead and test them for it. And IELTS was only meant to be for college, not little kids. You're not really meant to teach IELTS to little kids. Now, if you wanted to get started early to prepare, say, for the 9.0 test, that's great. But at the same time, like I said, IELTS was not meant for little kids. It was only meant for adults, you know, like kids that are basically on the verge of graduating from high school that turn into adults when they turn 18 and go on to college. The IELTS score is also what's used to help place kids in universities around the world. That's the reason why 
for just to be an English teacher, a non-native speaking English teacher, you must have IELTS 6.5 or above, 6.5 to 7.0 or above to be a non-native English speaking teacher, which I think is also the requirement for you to be able to go overseas to learn English or learn at a university in English in a different country. So that's what I do. But with, okay, so everything I talked about tonight is my English center, what I would do if I won the lottery to go ahead and build a better English center. And so, yeah, it's already almost close to the one hour mark. So I'm going to go ahead and say this, that education is the cornerstone of all civilizations. It is. And I want you to think about this because if you have English centers that provide quality service using authentic teachers, then you will get kids that can speak English really well. However, if you still patronize the corrupted English centers, then you are feeding the corruption that is in the English teaching sphere. I want you to think about that. And to end this particular episode, I'm going to go ahead and use the same words as my late mentor and person I used to look up to when I was a kid, Jerry Springer. Take care of yourselves and each other. <laughs>